From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. Bureau to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, my name is Kevin Cirilli. And I'm Taylor Riggs from New York. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. Happy New Year, Kevin. Happy New Year. Am I allowed to say that, Taylor Riggs? Is it technically enough time to say Happy New Year's? We're Let's turn there. next. You know, almost there. We're also almost to next week's Senate runoff elections in Georgia that will determine control of the Senate. The typical Georgia resident has been exposed, get this, to some 500 ads in the past two months. And about 70 percent of, of those ads are partly or entirely negative. Here was some positive energy as Bloomberg's Emily Wilkins, who is in Atlanta with more. All right. When you talk to voters, are, are there any independent voters left? I, I you know what, there might be some out there, but really at this point, a runoff is mostly about turning out everyone's core base. So the people who are out there talking to voters, trying to turn out voters, they're not as interested about plain independents and moderates. They're more interested in making sure that people know that, hey, it was great that you came out on November 3rd. You now need to come out again on January 5th. Emily, it's interesting. I'm curious about the highlight here, the the timeline as well, given that it took more than a week, right, for Georgia to be called in the general election. So are we going to know this thing come even next week? Uh, we're not going to know on January 5th, unless for some reason the race is not as close as all of the projections are showing at this point. We might have to wait uh, a couple days, but one thing to kind of keep in mind as we start watching the, ter uh, the results become in, in-person votes will be counted before absentee ballots, meaning that initial numbers will probably show Republicans with a good-sized lead. And then as absentee ballots begin to be counted, Democrats are going to start closing that gap. Now, whether they can close it all the way or surpass it remains to be seen. But just a note to sort of keep in mind as you begin to watch those returns come in. What have state officials said about the timeline of counting absentee ballots as well as pre uh, or votes that have already been cast? Well, there have been 2.8 million people who have already voted early. That's early voting. That's absentee ballots that have come in. And surprisingly, 100,000 of those people are ones who did not vote in November. And I think that really shows how intense the mobilization efforts on the ground are to get people registered, ready to vote, and voting for in this very short time period between the general election and the runoff. Um, once again, because we're seeing high numbers, it's just going to take longer to get the results and to do all of the counting that's necessary, especially in a close race like this one. Emily Wilkins, thank you as always for your time and for joining us on this New Year's Eve. And just another programming note, make sure to tune in to Bloomberg Television and Radio for special coverage of that Georgia runoff election. It is all happening Tuesday, January 5th, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern. And for more on not only the Georgia runoff, but really the, the, the stimulus, the economic outlook for next year, we're joined by Douglas holtz -Eakin, American Action Forum President. Douglas, always great to have you. Talk to us about some of the stimulus and the stimulus checks. We've been speaking pretty much all week long. People like Larry Summers, and then we had Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute with sort of conflicting ideas. What is your stance here on stimulus and those checks? Well, I think the checks are probably the least important part of the recently passed bill, and they were also the least important part of the CARES Act itself. Um, if you think of them as traditional stimulus, um, they're unlikely to work. Uh, we've tried one-time checks in 2008 under President Bush. Again, in the Recovery Act with President Obama, neither did anything very uh, impressive. Um, in, and in this case, the traditional multiplier mechanism that gives you stimulus just won't work. The virus interferes with it. You can't get additional people to work, and so you can't really get the, the impacts that you might hope. So as a stimulus matter, it's just, it's just not a very good policy. And so making it bigger doesn't help at all. I think it's best thought of as relief. I mean, there are people out there who have been unemployed for a long time. Uh, their, their unemployment benefits were set to expire. They're, they're, they're on financial fumes. And so giving them some relief from the, the impact of the pandemic recession makes sense. The problem with that is it's not very well targeted. These checks go out to people who have literally not lost a dime during this year and are not in any particular financial distress. So they've got a policy that really is neither fish nor fowl is not going to be particularly effective for any objective. And the idea that we should make it bigger, I think, just really is a waste of taxpayer dollars. Everyone you've probably talked to in the past year has said it's no big deal to run deficits as long as we're using that money to fight the pandemic effectively. This is an example of not using that money effectively. We shouldn't do more. Mm -hmm.
What do you say to Republicans? I've spoken with several Republicans, Doug, in the past week who have said to me they've been frustrated with the framing of this, not only by Democrats, but also in the media and to some extent even the, uh, in the think tank community on across the ideological spectrum, that they're having to make what they consider a false choice between support for stimulus and not caring about the $27 trillion national debt. I raise that because I think we've largely forgotten that when the president put forth the $2,000 support for $2,000 stimulus checks, he also advocated to remove pork spending from <laughs> the $900 billion plus bill. Yeah, he proposed a policy that was going to cost over $400 billion and then pointed to some line items in, in uh, you know, sort of uh, international affairs that would, that would add up to a couple of billion. So that wasn't exactly saying I'm going to pay for it, and it wasn't exactly uh, an act, I think, of fiscal sobriety. I think this was not a particularly well-formulated policy to begin with. I think it was uh, a political move and nothing deeper to, to try to get it up to $2,000. Um, and, and as I just mentioned to Taylor, you know, you, you don't want to waste money. You never want to waste money. And the idea that this is somehow free and that they're just being penurious by not handing it out to Americans, I think, is really – to, to really mislead the, the American public. We are going to exit this pandemic recession in the, in the not-too-distant future, and we will do it with the highest level of debt relative to GDP in the history of this country, and we'll have a federal budget, def, uh, federal budget overall that is on an unsustainable trajectory. There's nothing about that that's a good idea, and the idea that you can just casually make it worse, I think, is really misplaced. I think it's amazing we've had nine months to make this targeted, and we still couldn't manage to get a targeted bill. We're still going to send it to dead people, for sure. And so this, this makes no sense. It's really, as I said, there are a lot of things in there that I think are extremely valuable. The Paycheck Protection Program has a great track record, and, and I think you know, the idea that something needed to be done is exactly right. The, the UI benefits needed to be extended. Paycheck Protection Program, very important. And I think when the historians look at this episode, they are going to find that we had a big spike of coronavirus cases in the spring, and Congress responded appropriately and, and uh, effectively. We had another big spike in the, in the late fall, early winter, and Congress responded again. In the big picture, they've done quite well, and I don't think people should lose sight of that. Can I, let me push back gently here, just because, because again, I, I've been talking with conservative members of the Problem Solvers Caucus, for example, the bipartisan group on Capitol Hill, and when they point, Doug, uh, to the support for $2,000 stimulus checks, they're noting that baby boomers in the middle class have already been whacked in 2008. They could use some uh, fiscal relief. They're noting young professionals who have had to put their career ambitions on hold this year as a result of the pandemic because of a stagnant career growth opportunities in the economy. They could use the $2,000 relief. They're noting parents who have had to deal with the headache in the middle class of having to have kids go virtually to school. They could use that $2,000 to put forward to some type of tutor. Do the, does the Republican Party risk think alienating the middle class suburban voters when they lost them in 2008 to some extent in the executive level, not necessarily in the House, if they don't come out to support this, Doug? Well, I'd say two things. Uh, number one, the most recent election showed us that, by and large, the American public did not like the president of the United States, but they did like his colleagues in the Republican Party and sent more of them to the House and gave them the opportunity to hold on to the Senate. So I think it's an, uh, an overreading of the data to suggest somehow uh, the, the, the vast electorates had it with Republicans. As for the, the merits of that argument, that's a one-time $2,000 check that will not fix a stagnant career path. It will not fix a year of being stuck doing homeschooling with their kid while trying to work. It's not going to fix any of those things. The only thing that fixes that is a vibrant, growing economy. And I think Republicans have a good track record on being in favor of that, and I think that's where they should stay. All right. My thanks to Doug Holtz, Eakin, the American Action Forum President. Doug, Happy New Year to you and your family. And coming up today, it marks the last day of trading in 2020. We break down the year. Uh, we break down the year that was... Uh, we break down the year that was and look ahead to the new year with Alicia Levine. Have you started drinking Bank champagne York already? Mellon Investment Management Chief Strategist. No, I've had too much espresso. Happy New Year, Taylor. And Taylor, you said Happy New Year already. Mm -hmm. Right now in Bangkok, they're celebrating with speeches and a fireworks oh. display. There they are. Love it. There they are. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. From Washington, I'm Kevin Cirilli. And from New York, I'm Taylor Riggs. Let's get a check on the markets as we close out 2020. Abigail Doolittle, you have more. Abigail, what do you notice? You know, Taylor, what an extraordinary year. It included a record high in February, then a brief but brutal bear market, and then record high after record high. Net, net, it's almost hard to remember uh, that brutal bear market. We have stocks mainly higher on the year. In a big way, too, the S&P 500 up more than 15%. That Russell 2000 playing catch up in this fourth quarter, now up 18%. The big winner and what the Russell 2000 and the S&P 500, for that matter, were trying to catch up to, the NASDAQ 100 up more than 40%. What makes that so extraordinary, 2019 was a gangbusters year also. This NASDAQ 100 more than doubling in just two years through a pandemic. Who knew? That really has to do with the safety trade, the defense of some of those big tech names. Lagging, though, and perhaps next year's uh, catch-up trade, as many strategists are talking about, value down ever so slightly. As for that safety trade on the year, it's all about your Apples, your Amazons, your Microsofts, uh, Alphabet, and NVIDIA. These were the biggest point boosts to uh, the S&P 500. Big, big percentage winners as well. Apple, if you can believe it, the world's biggest company. This year, adding a trillion dollars, more than a trillion dollars in market cap. I can remember a year or two when we were on trillion dollar watch this year alone, adding that much in market cap up more than 84 percent. NVIDIA up 124 percent. Investors want in on these proven companies uh, through these difficult times uh, and also the stay at home technology. They really perform quite well. As for the biggest performance gainers, if we take a look at the Russell 1000, huge, huge gains here, especially Tesla up more than 700 uh, percent, more than 750 percent on the year, hitting a new all time high today. This really speaks to the retail trader, that momentum Robin Hood trader, because while Tesla has really managed to uh, turn profitable, stay profitable, added to the S&P 500 after five quarters in a row of profitability, you wouldn't really think that this is a company that would thrive through a pandemic, but investors want in on the future. That's true, too, with Enphase Energy up 570 percent, green technology, Moderna, the virus, a vaccine company up uh, more than 440 percent down more recently some sell the news action so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays into 2021 and then we also have peloton the ultimate one of the ultimate stay-at-home stocks up in a huge way the big question taylor is as we move forward and as the economy hopefully reopens as 2021 progresses how much do these technologies stay with us these huge gains suggest probably to some large degree probably some hybrid with the old ways, the new ways, and you have these stocks up more than 400%. Really incredible. Well, that is a great question, Abigail Doolittle. Why don't we get an expert to answer that question for us? We're going to do that with Alicia Levine, Chief Strategist of BNY Mellon Investment Management. Alicia, on that note, have we just pulled forward a lot of those future returns, or is there still more room in this market to run? Well, Happy New Year, everybody, and thanks for having me. Well, I thought, you know, we just had a great summary. I'll add something else to that summary before I answer your question, which is that the S&P is going to finish the year more or less up about 15%, which is extraordinary given the fundamentals this year. But the other thing is if you were not invested, not invested on the five largest up days, your returns were minus 20%, meaning there was a 35% difference in return for not being invested on the five largest updates. And I think that's something to think about. We've never seen a spread like that before. Something to think about when crises come and your instinct is to sell, you know, you have to be right twice, right? You have to be right on the way down and you have to be right on the way up. It's very hard to get that correct. So, some, you know, we think staying invested is the way to go. There's a 35% performance spread in the S&P just over five days if you weren't invested. So just want to remind our audience, getting back to the tech trade, look at, at you know, the some pockets have been frothy. They're mostly focused in the IPO and the, um, the tech area. And it is very unlikely that the kinds of performance that we saw in some of those notable names that you were talking about in 2020 is going to continue in 2021. So when you see enormous moves in names like that and in sectors, there tends to be a consolidation in the following year. Now that doesn't mean you can't have returns, you know, in the next few weeks, but we just think that there is going to be more of a rotation in looking for undervalued and underpriced stocks here, because in the end, there's a lot priced into that sector.
you know, this is a politics show, so we talk not only as it relates to the markets about what's priced in when it comes to stimulus, but how much of this market is also being driven by the Federal Reserve. It, it does the amount of liquidity that the Fed has said that they will maintain next year, uh, not I don't want to use the word guarantee, but almost make it possible um, for more rallies like the everything rally that we've seen this year. Yeah, look, I think there's no question that massive Fed liquidity during the moment of crisis in March, but also the second time in 11 years, an injection of Fed liquidity creates a certain kind of muscle memory in investors. And I think going forward, your average valuation is going to be higher because of the Fed put. There's no way of getting around that. We've all learned the lesson and we've learned it twice. And so therefore, this massive liquidity is a major underpinning of the market. And part of the reason that the market disconnected from some of the, the actual Main Street fundamentals this year, simply because the liquidity, liquidity kept asset prices levitated this year. You can't get around that. Policy mattered more than fundamentals this year. Alicia, I'm diving into my Bloomberg terminal, and I've Ooh. got the VIX pulled up. Chris Murphy, co-head of derivative strategy at Susquehanna International Group, is referring to the January 5th Georgia runoff, and he's uh, suggesting that volatility might actually decline once we get some more political clarity out of the runoff. Do you agree with that? Yes, 100%. Look, the, the race looks like it's tightening. The betting markets are coming in, and they're tightening. And I think it's unclear who's going to win those two Senate seats. And there's a lot of anxiety out there in the investor community because there's a reason the market was up 12% in November alone. And it wasn't just vaccine. It was also the election outcome, which saw split government, and in particular, the Republicans holding the Senate. And if that doesn't happen, some of that trade that went into November will be unwound but there will be less volatility because of the fear of that going into it. All right. My thanks to Alicia Levine, Chief Strategist of BNY Mellon Investment Management. And to our radio audiences, there is a Lego sculpture that I'm assuming was created by <laughs> a, a, someone very close to Alicia. And whoever the architect is of that, they did a great job. We turn now to Karina Mitchell for Bloomberg First Word News. Karina. Okay, Kevin, a very good final day of 2020 to you. President Trump is cutting short his Florida vacation and returning to Washington today, a day earlier than expected. The White House isn't saying why. Trump has been at his Mar-a-Lago home since December 23rd and has spent much of his time tweeting his claims of election fraud. His schedule change means he will miss the glitzy New Year's Eve party held annually at his estate. Some guests had reportedly already arrived. Meanwhile, the UK says it is ready for significant changes at the border with the European Union beginning tonight when it leaves the bloc's single market and customs union. Companies will have to file customs declarations when moving goods into the EU and lorry drivers risk a fine if they try to access the port of Dover without the right documentation. Potential disruption at the UK-EU border is one of the government's biggest Brexit concerns. Chinese President Xi Jinping used his New Year's Eve address to his country to praise his government's success in controlling COVID-19. China brought the coronavirus largely under control after it emerged in the central city of Wuhan. It is the only major global economy to bounce back. China has approved the country's first COVID-19 vaccine for general public use. And New York City has set a goal to vaccinate one million residents in January. Mayor Bill de Blasio tells CNN the city plans to put up pop-up sites and use schools to help reach that goal. He says New York will show the rest of the country that it can jumpstart the effort and inoculate people at a record pace. As of today, New York City has administered about 88,000 doses, 25% of what's been delivered. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. From Washington, D.C., I'm Kevin Cirilli. And from New York, I'm Taylor Riggs. And Kevin, the S&P 500 getting a new member next year. Clean energy company Enphase is set to enter the index ahead of trading on January 7th. Bloomberg's Emma Chandra has more. Emma, what do we know about this company? 
Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, Taylor, it is Bye Bye Tiffany Trinkets and hello uh, to Clean Technology. That is what Enphase is replacing, replacing Tiffany in the S&P 500, as you mentioned, on the 7th of January. This, of course, uh, because Tiffany being uh, gobbled up by LVMH uh, in the new year. Uh, Enphase, a clean technology company focused on solar power. The stock on a tear this year, up some 600% or close uh, to 600%. It's got a market cap of some $22 billion, and that has doubled in just the past three months, Taylor. Talk to us about the interest, not only in this stock, but as you mentioned, clean technology in general. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a huge amount of enthusiasm for clean technology and particularly for Enphase. And this really, as we've also seen, uh, their sales trail off. We were looking at triple digit growth uh, in Enphase sales uh, just a few months ago, or a few quarters ago. That has really uh, pulled back. But we are looking at sales or sales growth picking up again in the new year, but not at quite the same levels. Now, analysts really saying that it's all about this change in perception when it comes to clean technology. Ten years ago, it was seen as surviving on government subsidies, very experimental but now solar wind power they're established they're clean they're efficient they're cheap and many investors see them as attractive stocks uh, to hold as particularly as we see investors ride this ESG wave uh, into 2021 and Enphase is certainly a beneficiary of that another analyst saying today that its inclusion in the S&P 500 is really the index index starting to reflect uh, the change in the economy and change in industries that are powering the economy and of course the pre Previous stock to enter the S&P 500 was, of course, Tesla. Emma Chandra, thank you as always for joining us and Happy New Year. I guess it's a few hours ahead in London, so you're a lot closer to next year than we are. Kevin, you know, I was sort of thinking about the winners and the losers of this year as it come to markets. And I think I'll never be <laughs> floored the way I was in March when oil futures had turned negative. So I'd actually pay you to buy my oil futures, which is unheard of as well as that tenure falling below 50 basis points on an intraday basis on March 9th. Again, just unbelievable the rebound that we've had in these markets and some of the low points that we hit in March as well. Hey, Riggs. Hey, Riggs. You know what's going to blow your mind? Tell me. There was an impeachment this year. Oh, yeah. That was in January. And Can coming up next, that? we're going to check in with Congressman Denver Riggleman, a Republican who is in his final days of this Congress uh, representing Virginia. That's coming up next on Bloomberg Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio from New York. I'm Taylor Riggs. And in Washington, D.C., I'm Kevin Cirilli. President Trump is on his way back to Washington, D.C. after news that at least one Republican senator will defy Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and challenge the election results on November 6th. Senator Josh Hawley said that he will object to certifying the Electoral College. He will be joined by a number of Republicans in the House, including Congressman-elect Bob Good, who ousted a member of his own party in a primary convention earlier this year. We're joined now by the man whose seat Bob Good is taking. That's Congressman Denver Riggleman. He is a Republican from Virginia. Congressman, you and I have talked about this offline. Is this the appropriate path forward for the Republican Party? No, it's not. And I... Hi, Kevin. Hi, Riggs. Uh, no, it is uh, not the appropriate way forward for the Republican Party. And a lot of it has to do with one word I've been using. It's shameful. You know, the 5th District of Virginia, I don't know if you know this, the first congressman was James Madison. Uh, he beat James Monroe. And I find it very ironic uh, that the very, you know, district that I represent right now that was represented by James Madison now has an individual who's going to go on the floor and uh, protest the electoral vote is just it's ludicrous it's shameful and uh, i'm very sad for america when you see something like that you and i spoke about this briefly yesterday on bloomberg radio and that was what uh president george washington warned in his parting address about the the strength of political parties tearing apart uh, america and the country to follow up here you mentioned something to me yesterday on air in which you said and you didn't say who and i and i respect that you don't want to, to name who but that a congressman told you in confidence that they inadvertently retweeted a QAnon tweet what has to be done for lawmakers on both sides of the ideological spectrum to better protect uh, the American national discourse from this type of hate speech infiltrating our country? 
You know, the, it's a word that I think might be overused, but I think we need to use it right now, Kevin, and that's education. You know, it's, it's not just one congressman, by the way. I know that it was one that admitted to it, but we also know that I've seen others that have um, retweeted accounts that are connected to QAnon. I don't know if they think anything about it. I don't even know if they know it's real, if it's not real. I think they're looking for clicks. It's almost as if we need education in Congress on what conspiracy theories are, but I would think it's up to the individual congressman to do the research on what they're retweeting or what they're doing. And if they do something wrong, you correct it immediately. And I find that a lot of people don't want to do that because it might make them look like, you know, somehow they were ignorant about what they were doing. But again, it's up to the representative to ensure they're representing the people using facts and not fantasy. I mean, it's no different for me tweeting, Kevin, you know, the Lord of the Rings is a documentary. Obviously, it's not a documentary. That's not true. You would say, oh, it was a fantasy movie. But right now, we have people that are retweeting or spreading fantasy theories. They're couching it in reality. They're fundraising off it. They're grifting off of it. And this could become very dangerous if we continue to allow this to happen. Congressman, what then on that note do you see as sort of the future of politics and really the Republican Party as we're getting more and more polarized on both sides of the aisle and we've sort of lost the centrist, maybe more of a fiscal conservative, but maybe more socially lenient. But the minute we hear a view that opposes ours, we run out of the room and we unfollow and we further increase our echo chamber. How then do we really come together? Where do you see then the future and the growth of the Republican Party? You know, I, you know, that's a great question because I think at this point when we're talking about self-isolating in our own echo chambers, I think that's what you're talking about, Riggs, is that, you know, when you're self-isolating there, uh, what do you do, right? You don't want to go out of there because that's your comfort zone. So you're, you're constantly fed the same stream of information based on like, algorithmic targeting or based on how you're actually putting your profile out there based on hashtags and how you're doing those things. So what happens is, is that you come, you become caught up in that. That's where your baseline of who you are comes from. And it could be complete fantasy. And um, it almost seems that we need public trust companies like what I'm involved with right now is to do research and to do analysis, fact-based analysis using machine learning to identify those hashtags, those memes, and those individual accounts that are spreading disinformation. And we need to push that on to other individuals and say, listen, you're living in almost a cultic, cultist, messianic type of conspiracy theory right now, and you need to pull back. The thing is, as you both know, it's very difficult once people are trapped in that to get them out. And I think we need a fact-based mission to go after these individuals you know, using analysis. Congressman, you recently aligned yourself with the Network Contagion Research Institute. You have previously, prior to serving in Congress, served as an intelligence officer. Uh, what needs to be, and you have deep familiarity with technology as it relates to geopolitics, what needs to be done in the private sector? We talked about politics, but what needs to be done in the private sector to protect this type of uh, digital uh, hate speech from infiltrating uh, the private sector infrastructure? I think we need privately funded trust companies or public trust companies uh, that are looking at analysis from different angles. For instance, we did a report from the NCRI, the Network Contagion Research Institute on QAnon, and this is gonna be of interest to President Obama. We tracked the subpoena Obama or Obamagate hashtag all the way from its sort of inception on Reddit to when it got on Twitter by a user just named E, and then how less than 48 hours later, President Trump was tweeting something that was completely false. This is the metastasization of conspiracy theories and how they bubble up. So we can do, just like you do social network analysis or you do message traffic analysis, right, uh, uh, call chaining, all the things that I did in the military, you can do this with message traffic. So right now the NCRI is trying to get Twitter all the way back to 2006. We're trying to do a massive data scrub and aggregation to look at every single thing and how it actually how it blooms up from the recesses of social media and the dark corners of the internet and how it becomes almost reality to people that have bought into this. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to constantly hammer those individuals that are taking advantage of others. And when I say hammer, we brutally ham hammer them with data. And by the way, I mean, my teams in the last 20 years, we've done it that long, we're very hard to beat. And once you put together people like the NCRI, you know, it's uh, it's very hard to beat people who have th that kind of knowledge. And, to, and listen, if you're a conspiracy theorist, if you're a grifter, I'm your enemy. It's that simple. Quickly, 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 quickly. Why are you so optimistic that America can stamp this out? Because uh, there's so many good people out there that are trying to stamp it out. And, and I would humbly submit I might be one of them. And uh, I'm not going to allow disinformation to run the public discourse from the fringes on the left and the right and dictate policy in the United States of America. We're built on freedom. We're built on facts. 
do you know where else we're built on? We're built on courage. So I said, everybody, you know, if you have people out there that have bought into this with love and compassion, use facts to push back on that. And let's have a country that deals in specific information and not on fantasy like Kraken, you know, or Stop the Steal or Trust the Plan or QAnon or all that completely just gibberish and nonsense that's out there right now. Happy New Year. Our thanks to Congressman Denver Riggleman, a Republican of uh, representing Virginia. Taylor? Yeah, great interview, Kevin. Coming up, stay with us. A new strain of COVID-19. Well, it may affect more young people. We discuss Catherine Baker of the University of Chicago. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio from Washington, D.C. I'm Kevin Cirilli. And from New York, I'm Taylor Riggs. 2020, we know the story. It has been the year of COVID-19. Since the emergence of this disease, life as we knew it changed almost overnight. Concepts like lockdown, social distancing, contact tracing have become, well, commonplace. Here's a look back at how Bloomberg News has covered COVID-19 this year. A second person has died in central China after being infected with a new SARS-like virus. Our top stories this Thursday, China bans travel from the coronavirus epicenter with at least 17 dead and hundreds infected. We now have a name for the disease and it is COVID-19. We're seeing fresh cases out of the US, Germany, France, Iran. With the Dow Industrial set to record its worst drop since 1987, the VIX, which is now the highest going back since 2008. Governments and all other policy institutions are called upon to take timely and targeted actions to address the public health challenge of containing the spread of the coronavirus. We're looking at sending checks to Americans immediately. The United States is working with our friends and partners around the world to stop the spread of the virus. There's definitely some fear and uncertainty in the market, especially if you look at what happened overnight with the U.S. overtaking China as uh, the number one place with the most confirmed cases of coronavirus. I've developed mild symptoms of the coronavirus. This is a crisis like no other. It's worse since the Great Depression. Global deaths from the coronavirus have now surpassed 500,000. The global death toll, it hits a million. President Trump has tested positive for coronavirus. I learned a lot about COVID. I learned it by really going to school. We are all in this together. COVID cases are surging across Europe. The UK is forecast to borrow a total of £394 billion this year, equivalent to 19% of GDP. It's amazing to see the vaccine coming out. It's amazing to see this tremendous you know, shot in the arm for the entire nation, but we can't afford to relax now. That gives me chills. And now, well, a new virus strain that has been found also raising concerns. The variant found in the UK, Singapore, now California, spreading faster and appears to affect a higher proportion of people under 20 years old. This according to a report. Let's bring Catherine Baker, Dean of University of Chicago, Harris School of Public Policy. Great to have you talk to us sort of high level how you're thinking about this mutation and the strain and from a public policy perspective, how we tackle that just as much as we did COVID-19. Well, our healthcare system is clearly under enormous strain, treating people who have COVID alongside administering a vaccine. And we've seen slower rollout of the vaccine than people had hoped, and also less utilization of some of the therapeutics that are available. And together, that means the healthcare system is at the breaking point in a lot of parts of the country with so few ICU beds available and healthcare personnel really stretched. So we can uh, hope that the new back, the new strain doesn't spread quickly or widely. But even with the existing strain, we need to get the outbreak under control and get increased use of therapeutics and vaccines so that we can start to return to a more normal economy as well as a normal, more normal healthcare system. 
Talk to the C-suite right now. Talk to, to executives who are going to be heading in the month of January to meetings about how once the vaccine is available to coffee chain uh, store workers or grocery store workers in those particular sectors, how should they be planning right now for the spring to disseminate and to build trust for their employees to take the vaccine? Brief them for me. Well, I, I hope that some leadership by example will be helpful in that we see healthcare workers taking the vaccine themselves. I'd like to see leaders of companies whose employees are expected to use the vaccine to take the vaccine themselves. There is all sorts of evidence that it is safe as well as effective. We also need to see a return to uh, small businesses opening up again. The large corporations are an important part of the ecosystem, but the stimulus spending that I hope will roll out sooner rather than later will help keep smaller businesses afloat and make sure that there are paying customers available up and down the economy. I know that we want to talk about supply chains here I generally again from the public policy perspective how you think about a rollout of the vaccine the difficult challenge of course on getting it not only to some of the major cities but in some of the more rural areas given the temperature controls on some of the vaccines what do you see from a public policy perspective as some of the biggest challenges that we're going to face really in the next coming months there was certainly a lot of discussion about the logistical challenges of distributing the vaccine, but I think it was probably underappreciated how much of a burden this places on small hospitals, small healthcare providers who need to track different vaccines, the different storage requirements, make sure that we understand who's getting the vaccine and how the priority lists that have been developed are actually implemented on the ground. The partnerships with some of the larger pharmaceutical chains are likely to help with some of the logistics, but in the end, we're going to be relying on individual healthcare workers in often small and under-resourced hospitals to be storing, tracking, administering a vaccine that is increasingly complex as new formulations come online. And that, that's a wonderful thing. We need more vaccines to get approved to make sure that there aren't shortages, but each one may have slightly different storage requirements, slightly different dosing requirements, and that's gonna add to the complexity of an already strained system. You know, Taylor and I have talked about this. It is, it is totally, totally unprecedented where we find ourselves right now. And there was this op-ed in, in USA Today by Juliana Glover. And what she noted, Juliana Glover noted in her op-ed was that it, it, Americans understand that they might have to wait and have patience for a couple of weeks or months to get access to a vaccine. But that patience is gonna wear thin if they feel that the elites are entitled, feel entitled to get a vaccine before they do. How can leadership prevail or what needs to be done in the leadership space in the private sector to make sure, Catherine, that that doesn't happen? I think adhering to the recommended guidelines and priority lists is going to be really important. And those are based on healthcare need and on the needs of the public more generally. If we see people jumping the queue, that is gonna be really disruptive to people's trust in the vaccine and in the system, as you note. Uh, I also think that the patients wearing thin is going to be really problematic in the next couple of months when there's this great news about vaccines being available, but by and large, everyone still needs to stay hunkered down. Just because a few frontline workers have now been vaccinated doesn't mean that it's okay to go to a bar or that we can relax on crowding rules or that visiting in friends' houses is gonna be safe. It isn't, and the winter is particularly challenging in colder climates where people can't socialize outside. So that combination of trusting that eventually you're gonna get the vaccine when it's your turn, and in the meantime, continuing to abide by social distancing, mask wearing every time you leave the house, hand washing, all of those things that are basic and affordable, it's challenging to keep it up, but it's vitally important because, as we talked about already, the healthcare system is at the breaking point in lots of parts of the country. You have a background in economics. I'd love to go down an economic discussion with you, a bachelor's in economics from Yale, a PhD in economics from Harvard. Talk to us about the stimulus checks and not as targeted, despite having nine months to do this, our last guest. 30 minutes ago said that checks are still being sent out to dead people. Scott Peterson, death row inmate in California, getting a check. People whose income haven't changed, still getting a check. 
is that still good economic policy or would you prefer to see something maybe a little bit more targeted this time around? Targeting is really important for two reasons. First, it provides the kind of safety net that we need for families who are suffering, who don't have enough money for food and rent, for small businesses who would otherwise have to lay employees off. The more we can target towards those people in the most need, the further every dollar goes. But it's also important as economic stimulus that people who are in those situations are more likely to spend the money, which then goes to another person who can buy more things and employ another person. And that kind of multiplier effect is what gives stimulus spending the biggest bang for the buck or makes it more of a, a stabilizer in the economy, boosting the economy in the middle of a recession. Yeah. Uh, stimulus payments that aren't very um, targeted yeah. may just sit in people's savings accounts. Mm. We're going to have to leave it there. Our thanks to Catherine Baker, University of Chicago Dean for Public Policy. So many times, Taylor, it feels like we're just talking about the size of crumbs. Much more coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio from Washington. I'm Kevin Cirilli. And in New York, I'm Taylor Riggs. Well, a new year, a new administration will bring a fresh perspective on trade. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix spoke with UK Ambassador to the US, Karen Pierce, about the prospects for a trade deal between the UK and the US. And this happened earlier on surveillance. We do find a lot. I find as I go uh, on the hill, I get a lot of support uh, for a UK-US free trade deal. And also when I'm talking to governors around the country, uh, there's a lot of interest. 33% uh, of, um, I beg your pardon, 33 out of the 50 states uh, have exports to the UK in their top five uh, export markets. So there's a lot of interest in a deal with the UK. Ambassador, I don't believe the Prime Minister Johnson has ever met Joe Biden. Are there any plans for an early meeting? Um, I don't think they have met, uh, though the Prime Minister has met a number of, of Democratic uh, contacts very close to the Biden team, part of the Biden team. Uh, and I think that includes from memory uh, the incoming Secretary of State, uh, Tony Blinken, if he gets Senate confirmation. But the Prime Minister and President-elect Biden did talk on the phone uh, very soon after uh, President-elect Biden declared victory. Uh, I think the Prime Minister was the first European leader uh, to speak to the president-elect. They had a very warm conversation. They talked about a great many things, including uh, the free trade deal. They talked about Northern Ireland and the importance uh, of upholding the Good Friday Agreement uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and they looked forward to working together on climate uh, in particular and on COVID recovery. And the UK will take the G7 chair from the Americans uh, in January and COVID recovery is going to be at the heart of what we want to do. And we think that will chime well with President-elect Biden's priorities. Ambassador Pierce, what, what do you see as the, the biggest hurdle or you know, the biggest challenge for the UK-US special relationship? Uh, I think the biggest challenge, to, to be honest, is making sure that we see the new challenges coming down the track uh, in 2021 and beyond for, for what they are. Uh, and I think particularly of technology uh, in this respect. I think we're now uh, standing on the threshold of, of a major transformation uh, in technology. I personally uh, would liken it to the effect that nuclear uh, had in the 1950s. Uh, and I think we're really going to have to get to grips with that using all our innovation and science cooperation, uh, charting a way to make sure that as we develop this new technology, it develops on lines that do justice to open societies and open markets. Uh, we don't want, for example, to uh, wake up one day and find that there is Chinese standards on things like AI, uh, and cyber, uh, that would be too authoritarian. We want to have an open model. And I think the second, um, the second big challenge is the strategic competition from Russia and China, particularly China. Uh, we need to get that right again so that it's open societies uh, that are seen to thrive uh, and recover from the COVID pandemic. And do you think the UK and the US will actually work hand in hand to tackle some of the challenges that you just laid out? Oh, definitely. I mean, there's a very uh, deep, profound, successful relationship between the, the UK and US that has endured 
since the end of the Second World War and, in fact, before that. Uh, and it doesn't depend on individual uh, leaders on either side. And one of the uh, layers of that bedrock, if you like, is science, it's innovation, alongside the defence and military cooperation. Uh, but this is not an, an exclusive uh, enterprise. There will be a lot of countries we want to work with the great democracies of the world. We want to work with them to ensure uh, that open societies recover from the pandemic uh, and can go on to tackle some of these really big challenges. That was UK Ambassador to the United States, Karen Pierce. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. And that does it for Taylor and I this week. And Taylor, we made it. Happy New Year, my friend. Happy New Year. How many marathons are you doing next year? I don't, uh, half Iron Man is my goal. Ooh. Maybe I can get you to join me. Happy Done. New Year to Tom Keen, too. My New Year's resolution. TK, I always listen to Tom Keen. Much more coming up next. This is Bloomberg.